me just kick this off. Hope it works. How do you get the tackle? Um, so that explains a little bit about us. Sorry, your number was right, 275. That's only chicken. We do a whole pile of agri supplies as well. So look, what I want to talk to you today about is Manor Farm as a business and why we recently sold our business to Scandi Standard, the reasons behind that and the logic um, and how it may affect, in my opinion, Irish food production and Irish food uh, business development. And then I want to talk to you about Brexit. Um, we actually see it as a positive, so there's not too many people see it like that, but let me explain why. So today Manor Farm is very much a retail business. We're in every single uh, supermarket in the country, and I'm going to explain later the volumes we sell to each one. So every business story should really start with the consumer, and it's very difficult to come up with just a couple of graphs to explain why, uh, where our franchise lies within the Irish market. This is one, forgive, it's very, very busy. It's from Kantar, and what it's basically showing you is all of the meats, beef, pork, lamb, sausage, bacon, rashers, chicken, and uh, turkey. And then the color coding is dark blue is the empty nesters, older dependents, 45 and family, middle family, young family, and pre-family. Why am I showing you this? The reason I'm showing you this is for the last 20 years, I've been looking at this graph. It hasn't changed a whole lot. And what it tells me is exactly why some meats are growing and why some are in decline. So look at lamb there, for instance. So 41 and 27, 68% are 
two thirds of their shoppers are literally dying. So guess what? Lamb production, or lamb consumption is flatter in decline. And, and then you look at something like uh, bacon. Bacon is also very large amounts of people in the older age group, sorry. And the, one of the questions was why, when we try to get in behind that. I would love to tell you that chicken and sausage are the two fastest growing meats because of health. And in chicken, we can claim that, but it isn't true. A lot more has to depend on the fact of how our product fits in people's lives, and quite frankly, how they cook it. So in the case of chicken, you'll see that we've got the highest preponderance of young people eating chicken. But here's a statistic, now it's back, it's 2008, but 80% of Irish women under the age of 40 had never cooked a whole chicken. They only cooked chicken fillet. And that is what our market is, it's fillet driven. Um, likewise in sausage, the reason you have a large proportion there is they know how to cook it. In the case of the bacon, by the way, why is it uh, in decline? because quite frankly, people don't like the smell in the house when you have to boil it. So I thought again, I'd give you more stats, but this is basically saying that the chicken market is growing. It's growing because of frequency. We've got more people uh, buying chicken in the week. Secondly, our, our volume per trip is slightly up, but our price is down. And our price is down because of the, inefficient, uh, the efficiencies that are being built up within the business. So the price of feed and the efficiency is linking to a lower value, a lower cost product. But all of that is pointing to a very, very healthy growth. And we're seeing that time and time again. Chicken, as I said, is, is fillet. That's, that's really what it is. So 70% by value of our business is in fillet, only 17% in whole bird, and you see the rest there. So let's talk a little bit about our industry. And quality is, without doubt, the most important. And within quality, you're talking about the Board Via Quality Assurance brand. But not alone is it quality, it's also a, um, a mark of provenance. Because the Q mark, as you can see, has the tricolor below it. And we've seen that move in retail for the last, I'd say, 15 years. However, recently we've started to see provenance become really important in the food service sector, not least with Supermax and their Irish chicken fillet sandwiches. You would not believe the volumes that are being done by Supermax in chicken fillet sandwiches. They could buy cheaper by importing, buying import product, but they don't, they buy Irish and they've seen their sales go absolutely through the roof. So two big changes though have come in our industry and one is country of origin label, cool. And why do I say that's significant? Um, I'm going to talk later about competition from the north, from the UK. But in a period when they change the labeling, that means that outside of the 26 counties, you are not allowed to use the word Irish to describe your product. Two retailers, Tesco and Lidl, move to an all Irish supply. Now, that might not mean much to you, except when I start to tell you that Moy Park were the losers there. Moy Park in January 2016, because of their scale, were already 9% cheaper than I was. When Brexit happened, they got another 16%, bringing it up to 25. And today, they're about 30% cheaper than I am. And yet, they lost two thirds of their business. So I'm making the point to you loud and clear, it isn't just about cost. Uh, and I well understand the effect of currency, don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying there's other things, and chicken is one example of it. So. So I just thought I'd talk to you about consumption. You can see pork um, was Ireland's largest food. It's now given up its place to chicken. We're more or less the same at 30, uh, 34 kilos per person. Um, but you're looking at lamb at the bottom there flat and even beef is in decline. And we're seeing certainly a trend in veganism and vegetarianism is having effect on the meat sector. But thankfully, we're also seeing in chicken the move to low fat lean meat as being a primary determinant of, of demand. So I just thought I'd give you this in a very quick snapshot if I could. So here you have all the customers down the back, Super Value Centra, Dunn's, Tesco, Aldi Lidl, distributors, retail and, clean, uh, and uh, catering. And you can see the four companies, Manor Farm is in blue there. That explains the supply to the Irish retail sector from the island of Ireland. If I was to bring in imports, 
it looks, that same graph looks like this. So 43% of fresh chicken in Ireland today is not Irish. Where does it come from? It comes from everywhere, but it comes via Holland. And the, one of the reasons why I put this up for you is to explain where we're going to go in the future. You'll need it a little later. So where does it come from? Well, come on, baby. There. So what it does is all the surpluses right across Europe of uh, caps, that's the top torso of a chicken, find their way to Holland. And Holland is really trying to supply two big markets, the UK and Germany. We're on a third scale. But folks, every week, there are over four million fillets coming into Ireland. Irish people eat, on average, over four million chicken, or parts, usually the breast part, of four million chickens per week. So when you talk about a company doing 950,000 birds a week, we're small relative to our total market. And so I ask everybody, when was the last time you had Dutch chicken? And the answer was yesterday. Because anything that doesn't have a bone in it, pretty sure it's going to be imported. Okay, and that's what it looks like, 25 fillets in a tray, indicating. We just thought I'd show a, bit, a little bit of history in this. So again, our industry used to have 14 chicken companies. Today there's only four. And as you can see, ourselves and the Irish are growing all nicely. And the green line there is Moy Park. So this is where you're seeing them literally collapse. They have one customer left in Ireland, and yet the rest of us are growing and growing strongly. So inherent in our industry is a 3% growth in consumption in chicken per annum. That's pretty steady. Um, but what you have, of course, is that's all in breast meat. That breast meat, um, sorry, I think I've knocked this off. Excuse me. Uh, so um, that, that breast meat coming into is by far taking the, the lion's share of that demand. In fact, uh, since the recession, during the recession, Holberg grew, but it actually is in decline now. So we're looking at a very steady growth there. And I just wanted to try and go, if I can, to in uh, July we announced that we were selling our business. And I just want to tell you who they are. So they are a company in the four Nordic countries of Sweden, Denmark, uh, Norway, and Finland. And they are a chicken company. That's all they do. They're only a chicken company. But they are a chicken company with the highest standards in the world. They're our own, and I see Wayne Anderson here from the Food Safety Authority. There are only two countries in the world where they sell Compilobacter free chicken and Salmonella free. And that is Denmark and Sweden. And Scandi is number one in both of those countries. And what was so appealing to us was this idea of high standards in a peripheral small economy, which is exactly what we are. And what do they do? Well, they're 58% in retail, 19% uh, in food service, and they're a major supplier to McDonald's in Europe. And then you see industry and export. That was extremely appealing to us because for us as a business, we have to grow into food service. We have to grow internationally. And therein lay our problem. So from a manor farm, from a Carton family point of view, here we were growing like video, but we didn't have a successor within the family. I have five daughters, my brother had three daughters, so there wasn't an obvious succession within the family. But if you look at Foodwise 2025, Irish chicken production is planned to grow, it's actually double between now and what we're going to primarily do is replace imports. Um, to do that, we need to hit scale. We need to get bigger, and we need to be as competitive as uh, foreign players are. So what we're looking for is to get to a, what they call a chicken complex, and it's all the production and farms, production facilities and farms needed to do one and a half, two million birds a week. And that's where we're going as a business, and we can see that. To do this, however, we need presence in foreign markets. Because, as I said, for every 21 fillets in this market, we sell one leg. So we're exporting enormous amounts of uh, dark meat, wings, and offals. We, as a business, didn't have a problem sharing equity. I don't. Um, our senior managers, we've already done it. But the problem was funding. So we needed to spend in our business about 45 million euros over a period of about four years. Now, as an owner, what do I do? I go to my bank, 
and the bank will want to tie me up hands and, hands and feet, as it were. And uh, quite frankly, I, I'm in my late 50s. I didn't want to go through that course again. Secondly, you could go venture capital. Very similar arrangement. They want your hand and foot as well, but they also want to exit in five years, as does private equity. And quite frankly, the food business does not lend itself to that type of funding. Quite frankly, I believe it'll be about a seven to eight year uh, turnaround to really get the value out of any investment. So I want to throw a different idea in your head, and that is the Scandi Standard Model. So this is a Swedish company, as I said, made up of four country chicken companies. And what they have is a very different model. So their pension funds have come together and said, we will fund you in the long term if you deliver a number of things to us. One, we want 5% growth per annum consistent out in the future. We can do that in the chicken business. I think we can do that in the food business. Secondly, as a pension fund, it needs a, a constant stream of cash. So they've come to a deal that says, your profit, less the tax you pay, and the capex that you make, the, the, the remainder of that is called free cash flow. So we want you to pay 25% dividend free cash flow per year, out into the future. And for that, this relatively small business, and in my industry it's tiny, Moy Park in Northern Ireland alone, forget about the UK, is bigger than Scandi is. But here's a relatively small company able to use its paper, its shares, which we got, to fund its growth and also to grow internationally. I think there's huge learnings in this for Ireland, how we're to grow as, a, as an industry. Okay, so I just want to talk a little bit about Brexit. We don't see it as a negative at all. We see it as a positive, so forgive me for that. And if you again, going back to the story, so what do we do with a chicken? As a rule, we'll send the breast in Ireland. Uh, we sell the wings in the, the uh, the summer months, the four summer months, we sell them in Ireland too, but the rest are frozen exported. In terms of legs, we will sell some to the UK, um, but French frozen is, is a very interesting concept for us as a business, and I'm going to talk to you about that. And then if you break the leg into drums and uh, thighs, again, you can sell all the drums you like in, in uh, summer, but you can't sell them in winter. So again, they have to be exported. So what you're looking at is a model of international trade to support home value to be able to compete against imports. That's the basic logic of our market. So for us, is it an opportunity or a threat? Well, threat, yes, there's cheaper production now, 30% cheaper up the road in Northern Ireland. Has it been a danger to us? No, it hasn't. We've gained in share because of other considerations. What other threat could it be? Could they swamp us? Yes. Will they? No. Why? Because one of the fallouts out of uh, uh, Horsegate was the UK multiple stood up and said, we're going to get UK supply, British chicken for, for their customers. And what you have at the moment is the British chicken companies with literally a wall of demand. So they don't mind losing a little bit of share elsewhere. They've got oceans of it in the thing. So again, I don't see that as a threat. Definitely the devaluation is hurt. We've all seen it. Where we've seen it particularly is in the loss of our sterling sales, obviously, that, that devaluation. And what we're trying to do as a business is to get out of sterling markets until we get to a stage where we have a natural hedge in our business. And we do. So we buy from the UK as ingredients and packaging. And what we're trying to do is get our um, sales into the UK market in sterling down to the same level as our purchases. So if one falls, the other rises type of thing. They're, they, they match one another. Yes, you can go um, trying to cover the sterling forward, but literally that's only deferring the issue. It is going to come back no longer. And by the way, from my point of view, I believe sterling is going to get worse. We're, look at what's happening every time there is a, a, another hiatus in the UK, what happens? Sterling collapses. And let, believe me, folks, there's so much more to go through uh, as we go on.
So we're really in the business of trying to find alternative markets, but I want to just give you a, a little snapshot in two minutes. And this is our sales to different countries around the world. So the UK was a large market. And every time I looked at the UK market, folks, you either made a little bit of money if it was stable, or you lost a lot. Why? Customers, when you went to them, they built in the currency, but once the thing dropped, you were caught. So quite frankly, I'd love to tell you it was strategy, it wasn't, it was frustration, that four years ago, we decided to, to do away with this. So we invested three and a half million in our business, and we provided a standard of product that's acceptable to France, a Euro market. And that's exactly what we've done. We've built this uh, facility, we've transferred a production, but only now is it beginning to pay off. So when I hear people talking about moving markets and Orbea helping you, it is a long-term deal. You've got to survive in the short term. And so what we see ourselves doing is exactly that, bringing our Northern Ireland and, chicken and uh, UK sales down, replacing it with France and going outside it. But to do that, we had to change the way we did business. So normally, you don't like to commit to just one customer. It's a dangerous thing to do as a rule. We did it. So we have committed 75% of our output to a French company that we work in partnership with. Did I feel uncomfortable? Very much so. But well, thankfully, so far it has worked out. And as I said, we're trying to get back to this 7 million number of natural edge. So folks, that's, that's my story. Thank you very much for listening. Thank <laughs> you.